Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel which is very familiar to us, and of course it has several renditions in the various Gospel accounts. This theme of illness and healing and forgiveness of sins, doubt, faith. St. Diodocus of Fotiki, one of the writers of the Philokalia, one of his passages says that just as wax which is not heated and softened cannot bear the impress of a seal, neither can the heart of a Christian bear the impress of God, who has not been heated by the struggles of life and, and softened. We must have a soft heart, a broken and humbled heart God will not despise. And this man in the Gospels, this man who was suffering, paralysis, was one of those who had a soft heart and was able to bear this. Illness often comes in our lives, we know, but it is always for the good of our souls if we allow it to be, you know, struggles that we have. The famous and newly glorified St. Porphyrios of Capsule Calavia says one, it's one of his passages that, I did not ever pray to be well, I prayed to be good. And when we look at his own life, we can see that there's a list in one of the books about him of illnesses, which is about you know, that long, longer than my hand, the various things he suffered through, whether there was cancer or kidney problems or ulcers or blindness, you name it, on and on and on. But no one ever saw him complain about it, not once. Ama Sinkliti that great desert mother, just a number of years that one should wait even to complain about feeling poorly. Patience was required. St. Basil the Great, in his long rules, which were meant for monastics, has one passage in there which certainly is applicable to us all about should a Christian partake of medicine and doctors. Remember this is in the fourth century. Medicine was far different than it is now, quite different. But he indeed says that Christians can partake of these things because God gave them these gifts. God gave them the medication, God gave them the pharmaceuticals, God gave the doctors their hands. But he balances it with turning to prayer first. He balances it with not obsessing about these things and being able to accept when the oldest is unto our salvation and we need it. He also, amazingly, which probably all of us could stand to hear a little bit of, talks about older age, but I know people in this day and age and younger age do the same thing. They spend every other day going to the doctor. He doesn't approve of this. He says, because it obviously at some point it's not working and we need to accept that. Also, he says that to talk about illnesses all the time, how many times we've been around people that all they do is talk about their ailments? I know I have. It's not a pleasant thing. And sometimes we do it too. And he says, yes, we are sick. It is part of our life. It's okay to talk about it. It shouldn't be an obsession. It can be for our salvation. And it is certainly a harbinger of what is coming. God is preparing us for that death that is to come. So illness needs to be treated quite differently by a Christian. This man today had faith to be healed. Yes, his friends, his four friends had great faith, and the Lord saw the faith of his friends. But it is not always on the basis of our friends' faith that we are healed. Sometimes it can be, in case of we had the demoniac last week, and people would have liked him to be healed. We have people that have died that were healed by the Lord, people that are mentally ill that don't know anything that the Lord has healed. But in this case, the man had faith too. We don't necessarily see that from the scriptures, but the Holy Fathers, St. John Chrysostom in particular, point out that he did have faith to be healing. First of all, he let them bring him there to begin with. Now, how many people that we dealt with in our own lives who are sick, who did not want to go to the doctor, and they would fight as vehemently about it? This man allowed himself to be taken to the doctor, and then lowered into the midst of Christ in front of all these people, he shows forth his great faith, and that... The first thing the Lord says to him is, your sins are forgiven you. Now a lot of us would have taken offense at that. How dare he say that in front of all these people? But this man took no offense at it. He bears it humbly, knowing that it is true, that illness is a result of sin. Maybe not directly applicable, but sometimes. But because of the fall, because of our sin, illness does come about in this world. It is a universal phenomenon. He was able to bear that he realized the first thing that needed to be healed in anyone's life is the soul. But these men around the Lord could not accept this. It was the body first because they could see that. 
The soul was not taking first principles, all on sight, all on things that were outward. And the Lord could read their thoughts. And of course he you know, poses the question, which is easier to say, get up and walk, or your sins are forgiven you. Obviously they thought it was easier to say, get up and walk, or actually to say that your sins are forgiven you because no one could see it. So he did what they thought was harder, raising him up from his bed of illness, a man whose legs were not moving into perfect strength, but showing them by doing this that he had the power to do which was far greater, which they did not believe to be so. He forgave his sins. And you notice in the scriptures, there's a whole series in Matthew and in all the Gospels where the Lord goes through these healings, healing Peter's mother-in-law, healing people that are on their deathbed or have died, healing people that are blind, curing people of demons, people that are paralyzed, on and on and on, chapter after chapter, they will point out these phenomena to him. But why was the Lord doing this in such abundance? First of all, he does desire all of us to be healed. Sometimes he doesn't allow it for our salvation, but in this time, he was trying to reveal the kingdom to people and bring people to himself. And he was doing whatever was necessary to bring them to strength that they could fight that battle, to fight for their souls. But we have to keep one thing in mind that passes over our, our minds sometimes, is that that wasn't it for these people when they were healed at this moment. They all got sick again. They all died again. Lazarus dies a second time. The widow of Nain's son dies again. It all comes back. He did this because it was necessary to bring them to salvation with the hopes that it would strengthen their soul, strengthen their faith, and that they would focus on that one thing that was needful, the forgiveness of their sins. That the body should serve the soul, and the soul is not there to be ruled by the body. St. Porphyrios gives us a great example here. Throughout our lives, we are to pray, to be made good, not just some, that we do good deeds, but to be right in the eyes of God. I heard a priest one time say that he learned a lesson years ago that when he told a Protestant professor of his, how is he doing that day? He said, well, I'm good. He said, God is to be the judge of that. Let's say you are well. It's a good line for us. It's a good line for us. Because we don't know. We can't judge that. We can't try to follow the commandments. Ultimately, it is up to God. But we should be seeking first is the forgiveness of our sins. And we are all going to have illnesses. We are all going to have stresses. We are all going to have temptations and trials. But can we bear them to the glory of God? The Synoxarian is full of saints who spend their whole lives sick. But you don't hear about their complaints very often. Surely it hurt. Surely there were days when it was a difficult thing to get along with others when you felt that way. Surely sometimes they told people about it. Surely they went to doctors on occasion. But ultimately, they bore their cross, which we are celebrating today and remembering to, uh, tomorrow as well. That that instrument of death is our salvation. Certainly, some of us have heard of people outside the faith at points who will ask, why do you Christians wear that horrible instrument of torture around your neck? Or another priest say that he was asking, would you wear an electric chair around your neck? And he said, if the second person of the Holy Trinity came to the world, conquered death, sin, and the devil, and raised me up with himself by being in an electric chair, by all means I would. <laughs> and that's absolutely right. We need to keep in mind what this thing is we're wearing around our necks. It's not just a pretty piece of jewelry. It is our salvation. It is bearing temptations. It is bearing trials. It is bearing illnesses. It is bearing insults. It is bearing everything bad that comes to us as a Christian. Fearing not him that is able to kill the body, but only him that is to throw the soul into hell. That is the only thing we should fear, to fear God and to seek God above all else and to say, Lord, forgive me my sins. If you desire to make me well, glory be to God. If not, to be able to bear that also. And the reality is, as I've told several people in confession this week, they're complaining about their daily lives, you're going to die. And that is not me being harsh. You are. And so am I. So all these things we make such a great, tremendous thing out of really don't mean anything in the long run, except 
how they lead us to the kingdom of heaven or not, how we bear them, how we embrace them. So embrace God's healing. Embrace God's mercy, God's love. <clears throat> Recognize that trials come upon us as mere chastisements, as mere lessons, as mere lessons in the schools of life to bring us closer to the Savior who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray that your hearts be softened. Pray that my heart be softened. Pray that we might become good, not just simply physically well in this world. Amen. Amen. Amen.